Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming. It's really great to see you all on a lovely Saturday afternoon in Berlin. I'm, my name is Ryan Bishop, and I'm very honored to be here this afternoon with Orit Halpern. And she is going to engage in a lecture, not a performance lecture, called An Engine, Not a Camera, on Financial Intelligence. Or it um, probably needs no introduction to this crowd, but I'll just tell you what she's up to right at the moment. She's Chair of Digital Cultures and Societal Change at the Technical University in Dresden. Uh, her work bridges the histories of science, computing, and cybernetics in its interactions with design. So um, join me in welcoming Ori Talpin. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is going to be like boring and steadily ugly compared to most of what's shown in this conference. But uh, that's the issue with finance, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it's really not a very pretty thing. And it certainly makes a point, actually, of uh, making it hard to represent. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to just get started. This is work that's coming out of um, a new book. I have to wave it around because it's about capitalism, so I have to sell something. Um, called The Smartness Band-Aid that just came out from MIT Press. Uh, but it's also some new work. So actually, um, it's kind of uh, terrifying to be in front of so large an audience uh, when I really I barely know what I'm talking about. But um, today, I want to start with this uh, concept that we're in an age, and I, we've had a lot of really interesting talks here, of uh, a, a kind of maybe a new smart power, that there's a new geopolitics politics happening around infrastructure, but particularly computational infrastructures. From the chip wars um, over silicon conductors that are currently being waged, um, and the ensuing geopolitical rivalries engendered um, over these, um, these technologies and also the resources necessary to create them, to belt roads and the data systems that propagate them and are necessary for managing these logistical systems to new modes of extraction that always use Industry 4.0 and new types of computing to perhaps new forms of um, surveillance and tracking and identifying populations. We're arguably in a historically specific new era of smart government mentality through infrastructure. And you've heard a lot of things. And each of these places, of course, has lots of differences. So we could ask how this talk would relate to, um, for example, Chinese notions of power. But nonetheless, I would say they're shared by a shared faith, if you will, in big data and artificial intelligence systems is kind of fundamental to these infrastructures, and that those actual technologies are restructuring territory and um, governance across the world. Of course, this is not the first time in history that um, infrastructure has is, has played parts of kind of commanding and controlling territory. We have entire histories, of course, of infrastructures central to colonialism, empire, and the maintenance and control of territory and power. And this is an imagined kind of German um, vision of kind of controlling resources and, and um, travel to Africa. But um, obviously, there's British roads, uh, British railways, road systems, et cetera. There's a wonderful and important um, literature on this. And of course, there's a, there are many materialities to this. This is the Atacom and the lithium fields of SQM. Uh, there are many, of course, resource wars and never national security of the materialities, right, of um, digital computing. And I don't need to um, belabor this. But while we often like to study infrastructures that are visible and seeable and traceable and mappable, and actually, I'm going to talk a lot about models, maps, and territories today. <laughs> so I'm, I'm fulfilling my 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 my. Uh, assignment. Um, while these powers are material and wars are, of course, um, fought over these, uh, the actual whole, um, you know, control over territory and materials and extraction, this is also an idea, ideational and ideological and epistemological form of governance. It rides on also, of course, as we know, many types of algorithms and computational techniques that aren't just um, that have different forms of materiality. And today, the, the, you know, what is sponsoring most of these things, um, particularly things like the Belt Road, are sovereign wealth funds. And here you see uh, the largest sovereign wealth funds in the world. Um, 
Uh, and in general, ha a lot, you know, investment funds are kind of making this possible. All this construction is not only about control of the future, but it's about buying and selling the future. They are highly leveraged, every infrastructure project being put together on Earth today. Um, and it's possible by now that the China Investment Corporation, this is from last year, may, have, may be equivalent with Norway, which shockingly owns a lot of the world. Um, uh, I think something like 26% of Apple computers, for example, is owned by the Norwegian Wealth Sovereign Fund. And there's obviously a marriage between these financial technologies and, and other types of technologies and industries. So today, I'm going to really talk about the model of all models, the, mo that, um, the black skulls derivative pricing equation. This is what you really wanted to come here to talk about, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, this uh, seemingly innocuous equation that, um, that lots of people have heard about but probably don't know a whole lot about, of course, um, does come with a, a ge planetary geography. This is the reorganization of wealth. This is the current largest exchanges on the planet. Probably Asia will exceed North America um, within the next 10 years. Uh, but you can see the geography of wealth concentration and inequity that kind of rises with the financialization um, since 2000 only. So this is the last 21 years. I've seen massive reorganizations of financial capital. So there's a geography and a t and, um, uh, that lines up with this. But today, I'm not actually going to talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to mostly focus about this equation and its relationship to AI, and I think I'm going to pose fundamental questions about um, our own ideologies and imaginaries of how we uh, control and manage the future uh, at planetary scales. So I'm going to open with a really great, uh, I love it when economists make your point, um, although actually Fisher Black was an economist, he was actually uh, um, a kind of computer scientist and, and analyst. He was a student of Minsky's, he kind of didn't fit any box, but he spent a lot of his time at MIT and Harvard creating financial instruments with some of his friends and um, was awarded um, uh, a, uh, an, an, or I think post, well, he, you can't get one posthumously, but nonetheless, this equation won a Nobel Prize uh, <laughs> in economics. So we'll kind of put him in economics. But anyway, I love it when they make your point. And today, I'm going to read something he said in 1986. Noise, in the sense of a large number of small events, is often a causal factor much more powerful than a small number of large events can be. Noise makes trading in financial markets possible and thus allows us to observe prices for financial assets we are forced to act largely in the dark. I love it when economists say nobody knows anything and we're basically making money on like fake news. But anyway, uh, and to show that I have my little bouncing balls from thermodynamics, which are part of that equation too, but we'll talk about that. In 1986, Fisher Black, one of the founders of contemporary finance, made a rather surprising announcement. Bad data, incomplete information, wrong decisions, excess data, and fake news all make arbitrage possible. In his famous article, Noise Trading, Black posited that we trade and profit from misinformation and information overload. Assuming a large number of small events network together um, as far more powerful than large-scale planned um, events or decisions. Uh, the, um, assuming uh, events or decisions. The vision of the market here is not one of Cartesian mastery of, or fully informed decision making. Noise is the very infrastructure for value. In an age of meme-driven speculation, cryptocurrencies that burn energy, NFTs, and democratized options trading, such a statement might seem downright common sense. Um, even natural. Does anyone, after all, really think a cryptocurrency named as a joke for a small dog or an almost um, bankrupt mob-based game, re um, game re retailer is intrinsically worth anything? Of course they do. <laughs> um, for the past few years, great fortunes and major funds have collapsed and risen on just such bets. In retrospect, everyone seems to have perfect clarity about value investing, while at the same time, no one really seems to. Irrational exuberance, to quote Federal Reserve Board Chairman Alan Greenspan, is in the late 1990s on the dot-com boom. Might be the term, but Greenspan got it wrong. On one point, irrational exuberance was not market failure, but market success. 
For Black, who was a student of Marvin Minsky's, as I mentioned, also invented one of the world's preeminent trading instruments, the Black Skull's option pricing model, irrationality was not an exception, but the very norm, the very foundation for contemporary markets. Noise, Black argued, is all about a lot of small actions networked together, accumulating in greater effects on price and markets than large, singular, or even planned events, as I mentioned. Noise is the result of human subjectivity in systems with too much data to really process. Noise is also, and not coincidentally, the language of the mathematical theories of communication. The idea that we're all networked together and make collective decisions within frameworks of self-organizing systems that cannot be perfectly regulated or guided is ubiquitous today and integrated into our smartphone, trading apps, and social networks. Furthermore, we've come to believe that human judgment itself is flawed and that this is not a problem, but a frontier, a possibility, the very site of speculation and development, a new frontier for both social networks and artificial intelligence. The options pricing model that Black invented with his colleague Myron Scholes exemplifies also a broader problem for economists of finance. The theories or models, to paraphrase Milton Friedman, F uh, Milton Friedman are engines, not cameras. So this is a paraphrase by Donald McKenzie in an awesome book also titled yeah. Engines, Not Camera. Um, one way to read this statement is that the model does not represent the world, but makes it. Models make markets. Models in finance are instruments, such as derivative pricing equations or an algorithm for high-speed trading. There are assumptions built into the technologies about gathering data, comparing prices, betting, selling, and timing bets, but not about whether the information is correct or true, or whether the market is mapped or shown in its entirety. So it's about not really needing to represent the market. I don't need to know what everyone's doing. I just need to have a certain set of correlations figured out. These theories are tools, and they let people create markets by arbitraging differences in prices without knowing everything about the entire market or asset. These financial models are, to use Donna Haraway's term, they're god tricks. They perform omniscience and control over uncertain, complex, and massive markets. They are also embodiments of the ideology that markets, and that's a Bloomberg trading terminal, um, interestingly enough, Bloomberg took a photo of it right in front of the old market where you used to actually have people, uh, you know, s with stock tickers, uh, but this is actually their promotional materials. Uh, and they also have a help in the corner, so <laughs> you can read it however you want. But anyway, um, models in, uh, so um, as we mentioned, uh, this is an ideology that markets can neither be regulated or planned. These instruments naturalize and enact this idea that markets make the best decisions about the allocation of value without, of course, guidance from a state or other organizations. This infrastructure for contemporary noisy trading, I argue, is not, however, natural or inevitable. It was produced by the intersection of neoliberal theory, psychology, and artificial intelligence. If today we swipe and click as a route to imagined wealth, we should ask how we have come to so unthinkingly and unconsciously accept the dictates of finance and technology. So let's get to networking our intelligence, how that happened. The idea that human judgment is flawed or corrupt and that markets could neither be regulated nor fully predicted and planned has long been central to the automation and commercialization of the financial exchanges. So throughout the mid-20th century, increased trading volumes, and here you see a clerk actually still at the very last moment when uh, people were still kind of logging the transactions coming in, by, coming in um, electronically by now, but still there were like people in the loop. Um, uh, basically, the, the clerks were falling behind on transaction tapes. The, the dot-com bubble, the rise of hedge, hedge funds, these derivative pricing equations increased the amount of trading to a point where, where basically humans couldn't keep up with market activity. Um, and so that clerks would omit or fail to enter specific prices and transactions at particular time or group a number of uh, of, of incoming requests at the same time. And so human error and slowness came to be understood as untenable and non-transparent or arbitrary, that people were just arbitrarily assigning when you gave in your, your buy. 
Um, in the case of the New York Stock Exchange, for example, there were also labor issues. You may notice this is a woman uh, working here. Managers need a way to manage and monitor labor, particularly lower paid clerical work. As a result, computerized trading desks were introduced to the New York Stock Exchange in the 60s. This is an early desk from the 70s. These computerized systems were understood as being algorithmic and rule bound. Officials thought, therefore, commuting, co computing could save the securities and um, industry from regulation. That if computers follow the rules algorithmically, there's no need for oversight or regulation, right? And in fact, today, um, yes, markets are regulated, but the actual introduction of technology is not. That's why you can stick a fiber optic cable in and like win every, beat everybody, but that isn't actually considered regulatory. And the idea that regulators also believed was that, you know, computers follow rules. They're really rule bound and uncreative, so this is totally transparent. We don't need a rule to, um, to, to uh, regulate them. So, uh, so this kind of fantasy of a self-regulating technologically or technically uh, managed market was very central to the introduction of, and digitization of finance. This belief in the rationality and self-regulation of algorithms, and indeed, um, in 1982, the Bloomberg desk uh, was introduced, and you can see that here. Um, the, uh, this belief in the rationality and self-regulation of algorithms derived um, from a, a way longer tradition, though. It wasn't just then, it comes back to the Cold War, um, that reimagined human intelligence as machinic and networked. So, um, heralding back to uh, Friedrich Hayek, a very famous economist who's often seen as kind of the, the high god of neoliberalism and like, you know, um, Reagan and Thatcher ran around toting this book. Um, anyway, uh, he opens though with a fairly remarkable statement, if we think about it closely, uh, in 1945. He says, the peculiar character, character of the problem of a rational economic order is that of knowledge um, that never exists. Amazing. So we actually don't know anything. Um, the economic problem of society is, um, is not actually a problem of allocating uh, given resources, but rather a problem of data, uh, a problem set by these data. And to put it briefly, it is a problem of the utilization of knowledge not given to anyone in its totality, which, you know, that sounds like a really fancy way to say, like, basically human beings are ignorant and extremely limited in their perspective and subjective. It's amazing to hear neoliberals say this. And that basically, like, that's why we need the market, because we can't decide for ourselves. Like, only markets can make decisions at scale and only make the right decision. Only they can know what's right. Um, so human beings, Hayek believed, were subjective and capable of reason and fundamentally limited in their attention and cognitive capacities. At the heart of Hayek's conception of the market was the idea that no single subject, mind, or central authority can fully represent and understand the world. So he argued that this data, as I, as I mentioned, are can never be given to any one of us. Instead, only markets can do it, and that's why, of course, government officials and planners can't do it because they're also human and they're first subjective and all of that, which is really interesting, this kind of fantasy of an inhuman intelligence through networking that will make the correct or best allocation um, of resources and value. Responding to what he understood to be a failure of democratic populism that resulted uh, in fascism and the rise of communism, Haig disavowed, of course, centralized planning or states. But, you know, this talk, like I said, we might think really about China right now is probably contesting some of my own ideas. And instead, he turned to another model of both human agency and markets. First, Haig posits that markets are not about matching supply and demand, but about coordinating information. And lots of people like Philip Murawski have said this. So this is his first assumption that's embedded in that citation, is that markets coordinate information. That's what they do. Second, Hayek's model of learning and using knowledge is grounded in the idea that networked intelligence is embodied in the market, which can allow for the creation of knowledge outside of and beyond the purview of any individual human being. And third, um, the market itself embodies a notion of cognition and decision making I would call a kind of environmental intelligence in which the data upon which uh, such a calculating machine operates is dispersed throughout the society and where decision making is a population grounded activity derived from but not congruent with individual bodies and thoughts. So it's kind of like a a super thing. So Hayek's idea of environmental intelligence was actually, interestingly enough, inherited, however, from the work of psychologists, not at all from, um, 
finance or economics, primarily from the work of Canadian psychologist Donald O. Hebb, who is infamous for being also part of uh, Naomi Klein's shock doctrine and, uh, and those studies, but and we'll go over that, uh, who is known as the inventor of neural network model um, and the theory that, and I quote, cells are neurons that wire together, fire together. So in 1949, Hebb published The Organization of Behavior, a text that popularized the idea that the brain stores knowledge about the world in complex networks or populations of neurons. The research today, as I mentioned, is famous for presenting a new concept of neuroplasticity and also a new concept of torture coming out of these sensory deprivation studies. Um, the research is, uh, so um, the, basically the research um, was developed through working with soldiers and other individuals who'd been injured, lost, limbs blinded or rendered deaf, and it was also developed on uh, graduate students who were put in sensory deprivation situations. Um, and what it found out is that people could actually be mentally changed. They were fed subliminal messages, and these were science um, kind of students, mostly psychology grad students, and they basically came out like believing in like ghosts or things like that, and it showed that you could actually maybe rewire the brain using the environment, like not um, and for um, soldiers who had gone through trauma, the, these individuals also suffered changes to their sensory order, of course, if you've gone deaf or blind or something from uh, shell shock. But have noted that the loss of, the limb or of a limb or a sense could be compensated through training. He thus began to suspect that neurons might rewire themselves to accommodate the trauma and create new capacities. So actually what had started as trauma kind of starts to become this like, potential capacity. The rewiring of neurons was not just a matter of attention, but also of memory. So Hep theorized that brains don't store inscriptions or exact representations of objects. So I don't have every, every image of every person or every cup I've ever seen or every computer in, stored in my head, right? But instead, there's pa I store patterns of neurons firing. So for example, if a baby sees a cat, um, a certain group of neurons fire. The more cats the baby sees, a more a certain set of stimuli become related to that animal, and the more the same set of neurons will fire when a cat enters the field of perception. Um, and the, well, we know, uh, and this is quite famous, and if it sounds familiar, because this idea was the basis for contemporary ideas of learning in neural networks, starting in the late 50s, but now, of course, in common use um, with deep learning and, and neural networks. And, um, it was also an inspiration to Hayek, who in his 1956 book, The Sensory Order, openly cited Hebb as providing a key model for imagining human cognition. Hayek, so, you know, if you need a market, you need a human subject. So what's the, what's the, what's the type of person who comes into being with this market? It's obviously someone with this new um, neuroplastic network, neural net to intelligence. So Hayek used the idea that the brain is comprised of networks to remake the very idea of the liberal subject. So when we talk about liberalism, we might want to give it a little historical tint here, because neoliberals actually are positing quite a different vision than the enlightenment subject uh, that we often assume. Hayek's subject is not one of reasoned objectivity, but rather subjective, with limited information and incapacity to make objective decisions. The concept of algorithmic replicable and computational decision-making that Hayek forwarded during the Cold War was not the model for the conscious, affective, and informed decision-making idealized through the enlightenment made by these men um, uh, that we commonly think about, but nor actually was it the rational, um, uh, informed decision-making of the kind of Cold War uh, game theorist, for example, at RAND. So these people were uh, computational and, and data-driven, but they were still considered experts. We have this kind of dumb, not dumb, that's unfair, that was normative, I take that back. Uh, but we have this kind of ignorant intelligence operative here that's quite different. Um, Rather, he reformulated agency as the freedom to become part of a market or network. He was very specific about the point that economic or political theories based on collective or social models of market making and government were flawed in privileging the reason and objectivity of the few policymakers and governing officials over the many and um, quelling the ability. Uh, so he actually saw them as like counter emancipation of minorities. Like that was the problem. Like a couple people making decisions is in his vision. Um, counter-democratic and counter a plural society. 
Hayek elaborated that freedom, therefore, was not the result of reasoned, objective, like I said, decision-making, but rather simply freedom from coercion by the state or, freedom, or the freedom to become part of a market, a, f a kind of freedom from any effort to exclude from chosen economic activities or markets, and that becomes the sole point of the state. Which brings us, of course, a bit to machines. Neoliberal uh, theory thus posited the possibility that markets themselves possess some sort of reason or intelligence or some sort of sovereignty, a reason built from networking human actions into a larger collective without planning and supposedly politics. In the post-war period, of course, many other human social and natural sciences also came to rely on models of communication and information, so Hayek's kind of not the only person thinking this. Um, and that, and that came out uh, in a lot of places. But in a particular place, so people really uh, envisioned this vision of the market as sort of the sovereign thing you had to be. Um, and of course, as, as cybernetic concepts kind of emerged, managing systems, including political and economic ones, came to be understood as a question of information processing and analysis. In 1956, a series of computer scientists, psychologists, and other scientists embarked on a project to develop machine forms of learning that they then came to call artificial intelligence. And here we see Frank Rosenblatt in front of the first kind of operative, what he called perceptron, which is the first neural net. And then, like, literally, it was a bunch of nets, like, really wired together uh, with some uh, switches put in together. And in producing this uh, model, he said his inspiration was Heb Hayek. Uh, have attempted to integrate specific, and that that is the model of psychology that um, he would try to uh, automate or test or experiment with in his work, leading, of course, to the uh, development of uh, the first um, neural net. And this idea, so his innovation was he had a new concept uh, that neurons, and this came from other people like Pitts and McCullough, but he had neurons were more switches or nodes in a network that classifies cognitive input, and the intelligence emerges only at the level of the group of nuts making a decision, not at, the, at any one decision point. So it was grounded, it was the exact same model as the Hebbian, like remember the baby and the cat. The idea here is you don't have to explain to the baby what a cat is. The baby will just eventually learn what a cat is. And so the fantasy of the neural net is ultimately one of not having to represent the problem to the network right before you see it. And I'm not going to give you a long lecture on what these are because I bet you lots of people here know what they are way better than I do. But I, you can ask me if you have any questions. But the point is that neural networks just like uh, it didn't work actually in the early in the in the late 50s because there wasn't enough data. But their idea, much like the idea of of Hayek's market, is that fundamentally the system can learn by pulling together a lot of stupid little decisions into making kind of uh, statements about whether something is true or false, yes or no, et cetera, and enacting these um, uh, these sort of logic operations. The key, therefore, is a large number of stimuli, which Rosenblatt stressed means the approach to nature of uh, learning in terms of probability rather than symbolic logic, and they was, went on to be sort of the early genealogy of the contemporary um, neural nets. For both Rosenblatt, um, while each, so this and made the computing linked, of course, to the future of um, the market, and of course created a situation where we can imagine systems growing and learning and changing without having to represent them or fully know them ahead of time. And this is kind of the key features. So the disavowal of representation continues to fuel the desire for ever larger data sets and unsupervised learning in neural nets, which would, at least in theory, be driven by data. As a result, the neural net became the embodiment of an idea and ideology of network decision making that kind of could deal with random um, situations uh, that could scale from inside the mind to the planetary electronic trading platform and global markets. Which brings us to the question, though, if this is going to be the mode of creating markets and um, 
produce speculating, then how do we speculate? How to price the future in a world where you theoretically can't know your system, right? So though it's been traditionally very difficult for traders to determine how much the option to purchase an asset or stock should cost, up until the 70s, it was widely assumed that the value of whatever I buy, uh, option to buy a stock, would somehow be re related to the expected rate of the turn of the underlying stock itself, which in turn would function as a sort of indicator of the health and profitability of the company that issued the stock. So till the 70s, people kind of had a relationship between finance and let's call it reality for lack of a better <laughs> word. But this understanding not only presumed, of course, that you could measure and, and, and represent value, but also that models themselves represent or abstract from something real out there in the world. But that all changed in 1973. Black and his colleague Myron Scholes and Robert Merton introduced this wonderful equation, the Black Scholes option pricing model, in order to provide a new way of relating option prices to the future. What made this model unique in the history of finance was it completely detached the price of an option from any expectation about the likely value of the underlying asset. Since, remember, you kind of don't know anything, you can't really tell the whole market, you have very limited information. Instead, what you really have to focus on is what you can know. And what you can know is the volatility of the stock. You can know how much um, stocks have moved or changed uh, in a certain amount of time. And then you can just kind of add a, a little normal curve on that, and you can start betting on things. Um, and you can start betting on the volatility of one thing in relationship to the volatility of the other thing. And that's pretty much what you're doing with these equations. Um, so the Black Skull's option pricing model, in other words, was not interested in the true value of the underlying asset, but its relationship to the stock, uh, of the stock to other movements in the market. So it's totally relational. Skull and Black had begun working together in the 1960s while consulting for investment firms, which were involved um, uh, in uh, attempting to automate portfolio theory. That is, they were trying to automate how we combine bets in order to uh, minimize risks. So uh, he did this, and this kind of led, and so this relationship to computing, but also to broader ideas of the kind of unknowability of the market and its networked relation um, kind of founded the, the kind of epistemological grounds or ideological grounds for producing these technologies. And the result of these technologies, of course, was literally the technical realization of the fact that options cannot be correctly priced. And mispricing, that is imperfect information transmission, must therefore be essential to the operation of the market. Because they open their thing saying, if options are correctly priced, it sh in the market, it should not be possible to make sure profit. I mean, how's anyone going to make money if we all get the right price? Uh, there's nothing, no money to be made here. So everyone's got to be lying and cheating and essentially faking things out. And people are just randomly making bad decisions. And that's how you make money, really. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a it's got interesting implications, and maybe also we could extend it into post-truth questions as well. But for now, um, this is the fundamental status. So as a result, uh, the insights of reasonable traders might matter less in pricing assets than they would in measuring. So basically, you should really just stick to kind of measuring volatility and not bother with anything else. So the Black Skull's um, derivative pricing equation effectively extends this assumption inherent within both neural network theory and neoliberal economic theory at the same, at the time, uh, to financial instruments that you can actually use. Um, and to bet on futures. Stocks, they reason, behave more like random thermodynamic motions of particles in water than proxies or representations of some underlying economic reality. The market is full of noise, and they literally imported the equations from thermodynamics just to help you out. Uh, the market is full of noise, and the agents, the traders within it, do not, cannot know the relationship between the price of a security and the real value of the underlying asset. However, if agents recognize the limits to their knowledge, if we accept our kind of subject they can focus on what they can know, namely how a single stock price varies over time and what that variation relates to the price of other stocks. And then it gets more and more complicated with debt swaps and futures thing and betting the future price of the stock against other future. Anyway, you can see where this is all going. It gets very exciting. Within weeks of the article's publication, numerous corporations were offering software for such pricing equations 
We then uh, literally, like with the equation, was offered this the Bloomberg trading uh, terminal, amongst others. And this was in part a consequence of the fact that the model joined communication and information theories with calculation in a way that made the equation amenable to algorithmic enactment. As individuals falling black in skulls and creating more complex derivative derivation instruments, computers became essential. You basically cannot do this without a computer uh, and the speed of uh, and the infrastructure of computation. So there's both a, an epistemological infrastructure that believes in a certain type of intelligence and decision making and its automation, and a material infrastructure of your fiber optics and your computers and all that. As individuals followed black skulls and creating more complex derivation instruments, computers became essential for both obtaining data about price volatility and calculating option prices. An entire industry, the financial markets of today, were born from this innovation and its new understanding of noise. Since the 1970s, derivative markets have grown massively around 20 25% per year over the last 25 years to now exceed the world's GDP by some 20 times. So everything you make, in general, if you work or pay taxes, you're poor. Um, and you're not part of this big party over there. And of course, I could also track wealth equity separations, which uh, go extremely massively up, but uh, really after 2000, go insane. Um, but there's also a deeply repressed geopolitical story that I want to kind of tell here behind these innovations in finance. As I mentioned, the big point of all these um, equations is that they're about dispersing risk and mitigating it. It's about being able to he put a lot of bets together in relational places so that like, you can hedge your bet when bad things happen or depending on your view, or good things, depending on our, yeah. uh, either way. And so um, it's really important to realize that these equations emerged on the heels of the end of Bretton Woods, civil rights movements and the kind of unrest in American uh, cities. So there's a post-civil rights backlash that kind of feeds into this ideology, decolonization, and in fact these, um, and the OPEC oil crisis, which was kind of related to a post-colonial scenario, all of these situations were, so these, these instruments were built to deal actually with the petrodollar collapse, with the fact that you didn't know what the price of your commodity would be leaving the port of Hamburg and coming to, to uh, the port of New York. And so you had to find ways to bet into the future and manage those risks all over globally. Um, and so one way, and so if commodities were the big frontier because of course many of the areas you were extracting materials from were, were in the midst of civil wars or volatiles. So these are, uh, so it's really important to try to really think about how our AI and our finance are linked to kind of manage geopolitics. Um, so through the likes of derivation technologies such as um, short bets, credit swaps, and futures markets, dangerous bets could be combined with safer ones and dispersed across multiple territories and temporalities. Corporations, governments, and financiers flock to these techniques in order to manage seemingly unknowable, unable, and unquantifiable risks. The impossibility of prediction, the subjective nature of human decision making, and the electronic networks of global media systems all became infrastructures for new forms of betting on futures while evading the political economic crises of the day. And now I'm just going to turn to end really quickly, but to speak about models and machines and what do we think about them. So neoliberal economics often theorizes the world as a self-organizing adaptive system to counter the idea of planned and perfectly controllable political and potentially totalitarian orders. Within this ideology, the market takes on an almost divine, we might think of the invisible hand or perhaps biologically determinist capacity for chance and emergence, but never through consciousness. Evolution was imagined against willed action, so systems that had willed action were those who couldn't change, couldn't adapt, couldn't be fast enough. And the reasoned decisions of individual humans, more critically, emerging the historical context of the civil rights, uh, post-civil rights movements and calls for racial, sexual, and queer forms of justice and equity, the negation of any state intervention or planning, say affirmative action, became naturalized in the figure of the neural net and the derivative. So these two are now, I think, the structuring, actually, um, infrastructures for our, plan for our planet that actually allow us to bridge from within our, our heads to our, our, our practices and link together into a new global geography to planetary scales um, of kind of new forms of management and territoriality. And like I said, you know, 
there's obviously differences between how these technologies correlate depending on time, space, history, you know, location, but there's also shared similarities in how these techniques are being spread. Um, by tying together disparate actions and objects into a single, but however, so that's really depressing. Okay, so we have this depressing, sad song where like politics is being um, erased through um, a, a particular mode of financialized intelligence and technicization that links artificial intelligence to uh, global capital through particular types of instruments. But for the last moment, for a little bit of hope and probably why we're all here, um, we, <laughs> we've become attuned to this model of the world, of course, where machines and markets are syncopated with one another. These models, however, might also have potential to remake our relations to each other and the world. As cultural theorist Randy Martin has argued, rather than separating itself from social processes of production and reproduction, algorithmic and derivative finance actually demonstrates the increased interrelatedness and globalization and socialization of debt and precarity. By tying together disparate actions and objects into a single assembled bundle of relocated risk to trade, new market machines have made us more indebted to each other. So that subprime rate, like you know, middle class people and poor people were suddenly put together in the crisis over their loans. The political and ethical question thus becomes how might we activate this mutual indebtedness in new ways once they're less amenable to the strict market logics of neoliberal economics. Every market crash, every subprime mortgage event reveals the social constructedness and the work, aesthetic, political, economic, it takes to maintain our belief in markets as forces of nature or divinity. And it is not aesthetically smoothed over if it's not aesthetically smoothed over through media and narratives of inevit inevitability. They also make it possible to recognize how our machines have linked so many of us together in precarity. The potential politics of these movements moments has not yet been realized, but there have been many efforts, whether in the Occupy or more recently in movements for civil rights, racial equity, and environmental justice, such as Black Lives Matter, or as I'm showing here, the Chilean anti-austerity protests of 2019 that did inaugurate a new regime and a new and very progressive constitutional process. Unfortunately, that process has now failed, so this is less, <laughs> so I can't even be that positive now, like basically, um, but, uh, you know, still, it's a process that got started and hopefully uh, will still result in a new constitution. If all computer systems are programmed and therefore planned, we're forced to contend with the intentional and therefore mutable nature of how we both think and perceive our world. And I'll leave us with that. Thank you very much, or now we move to that section called Q&A, where you have Qs, she has As, and uh, we, we have some discussion. Supposedly I don't know very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of ignorant. I'm going to have to pull the... <laughs> the performative element is going to come to the fore. Um, there, those of you who are joining online, you can also, through um, the Telegram, is it Telegram app? Uh, you, uh, you're able to um, ask questions online. So while you're gathering your thoughts, I'll ask a question if okay. that's okay. Um, I guess, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting to me is the way in which the idea of the market as a transcendental signifier masks or comes on the heels of continued unrest, geopolitical concern to have absolute control. And Rand Corporation's uh, slogan is to control events wherever they occur. Right. right, and so that whole idea that is, you know, the Cold War C3I um, mode of global uh, surveillance control, all emerge from issues of volatility and precarity, mm -hmm. and that all of this drives from the ways to take aleatory events and convert them to your own game. So, is that kind of a way of beginning to think through a grander? way of mapping, say, the moment from Hiroshima to the present? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, well, you point out a couple of interesting things that I absolutely agree with, which is one, obviously there's, um, there are basic, like the conception of this, right, starts in 1945. Yes. And so, or we mark it there. Um, and so that we can see here in many ways an extension of Cold War logics. However, you know, one of the interesting things we have is this question of scale in this conference yes. and that in many ways, whereas we still had RANDs and these kind of elite, uh, mm -hmm. like, experts, 
we can talk a bit about the democratization and maybe even the molecularization or like the scalability of this kind of concept through its integration into technologies, whether up they're, and yeah, yeah, up and down. So from synthetic biology, which is also right. really about computational um, si simulation, manipulation, et cetera, to, um, to, you know, logistical systems, we're seeing a new, I think, intensification of certain trends that were started in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, we're also, you know, it's really interesting and it's also really important to kind of point out that there seems to be, along with this kind of fantasy of self-organizing systems, seems to be a, an increased new rise of sort of, sort of new totalitarianism or new mm -hmm. uh, or oligarchy and things like that. So obviously we, we have to be contemplate, we obviously understand that this fantasy, this particular re, yes. um, redefinition of freedom very particularly, it's about freedom and agency. Yes. And it is not framed in terms of things like civil rights or, no, or no. any of these frameworks. Uh, clearly, is a mode of freedom that lends itself to new modes of con to intensified control yeah. uh, and even concentration of power. Yeah. Um, and so I think that, that I, I'm really interested in that. And I'm really interested also at the moment in the Cold War, at the beginning, people were still thinking about this consciously. There's a real question, what new tactics do we need? They hadn't yet turned it, they hadn't yet automated it. And I guess one of the questions is what happens when you like automate RAND at scale, or yeah. what happens when you have a, a level of automation and that it drops out as a question of conversation. Like I don't hear us no. talking about or worrying about a lot of things that people in Cold War were still worried about like, um, and particularly in this case, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not finding much, you know, questions, you know, the, the questions of civil rights seem to have dropped out in the, in the name of, of other discourses of freedom or... Yes, it gets reconstituted in, yeah. through these systems where, in which individual agency is absorbed into the larger communal, which isn't even communal anymore. Yeah. And, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the relationship to noise here because noise as the fungible entity that's operative here because in some elements of information theory it's to expunge noise but in order to make the signal pure but you can only know the signal if there's noise. Right. So you can only, I mean structuralism 101, it's to be able to, to tell that difference from what it's not. So in, in this, in, in the kind of derivative model noise functions to create its own signal then, is that correct? In a certain sense, yeah. yeah. But, you know, and, and we could have a whole conversation about that, but as a historian, my main kind of note is to ask what, what's at stake and what are, right. what are the implications of the fact that we don't care about noise anymore? Like, so the issue is that people like <laughs> angsted about this and like, like Norbert Wiener, you know, if you look at people at the beginning, they're really worried about getting false news. They're really worried about getting this stuff. Yeah. And then what happens, and many people still are, of course, I don't want to say that not at all, but you can also see trends where noise becomes a site of potential instead of a site of, um, of, of delay or a problem with getting your signal to the other side. So that shift is always really interesting when something that was a problem now becomes a capacity or the very yes. infrastructure yes. for new technologies and new institutions and new forms of, uh, and new tactics. Yeah, I don't know. it's again turning the aleatory to your own advantage. Yeah, perfect. So, um, questions in the Someone room? Someone back there. Yes, there's one at the back there. Thanks. Hi. Um, I this might be a this might be a slightly insider baseball question, but I'm curious whether, like, whether there's much discussion in Hayek's work about his sort of seeming disavowal of the sort of central planning idea, yet his maneuver to also posit like essentially like the cybernetic logic gate as a central organizing like mechanism in of itself. There's actually, I, I shouldn't mention, I, I, I can't remember the author. I know there's actually an excellent author on like the question of emergence in Hayek. Like he has a huge tension because also he forecast that, you know, everyone, all these neoliberal, all these Mont Pelerin people said, oh, the US and, and Britain are gonna collapse. 
you know, after World War II, these Keynesian states can't go on, and, and it didn't happen, so then they had to start explaining, you know, kind of justifying, you see then that more and more turn, like with the sensory order, with other texts where he's really turning to cybernetics and to biology as the new discourse to like replace an older, so he starts out with questions of human freedom, and then they ends up in, in the world of like evolution. Mm -hmm. And evolution is really great because it provides a way to say systems change and adapt and, and, and are productive without human consciousness. So he really starts taking up um, what's well, like a baffin? Am I that? I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. He starts taking up these systems theories more and more heavily. If yeah. you really look at his work and in the, and like talks and like the post like late fifties, early sixties, they start really moving that route. Yeah, the version of Hayek that gets picked up by the neoliberal order of Reagan and Thatcher is a very watered-down version yeah. of Hayek's thought, which is, uh, and a lot of people are revisiting all yeah, that yeah, in yeah. some of the sustained and, and productive ways. Yeah. Of Hayek? Yeah, Hayek, yeah. H-A-Y-E-C-K. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for the lecture. This was very amazing, thrilling. I, I declare myself a fan. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, and um, I was just uh, wondering, so um, after giving all of this genealogy of uh, neoliberal thought and the ep epistemology and psychology be uh, behind neoliberal thought, um, I would be interested because I, I found myself on, on my own research very entangled with all of these ways of thinking uh, thinking network uh, network D and how to conceive of a political subject that is not that does not act out of individual consciousness but out of like basically using this very much ontological very same uh, ontological principles of um, enacting and performing networks so my question is uh, what do what to do when we are so entangled within this uh, neoliberal ontology and way of thinking how can we think productively out of it with it against it uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, I'm right now in this crossroads. <laughs> <like>. <laughs> well, you know what, I think that's like a group. <laughs> now we need the group. Uh, uh, that's something for us to work uh, on as at collectively. And obviously lots of people are, right? So um, for starters, there's a huge interest in collectivity, right? Mm -hmm. From uh, artistic practice to political activism. That's a time attempting in many ways to, you know, it's that adage, like, we make, there's an adage, right? We make history not under conditions of our choosing, but also none of us want to replicate a reaction, or I don't want to be a reactionary. So I'm not here to throw out my cell phone and my social network. I might not even be here to throw out my financial instruments. Uh, I think one of our interesting questions is, can we put them in new relations yeah. so that they do different things? So, like, just to answer pragmatic things, there's, you know, there's obviously, uh, there's a real difference between, you know, the January 6th protesters and maybe the activists of Black Lives Matter. And part of that has to do with how we understand time and maintaining an imaginary. And part of it has to do with diversity, which means diversity of tactics. Like for me, I'm a real kind of fan of the untimely. Like that it's really great that we have these technologies, we use them, but it's also really interesting when we have memories or we encounter different modes of thinking and different ways of acting and that we don't say it's one or the other. Like sometimes you wanna join a collective and maybe sometimes you do need a single authored book. And like I think part of it, of the struggle is actually against homogeneity in thinking that like there's only one way we need to do, like all art has to be collective or all art has to be singular or all, you know, all these things. and. And then also just pragmatically, you know, right now there's a whole move in like environmentalism, environmental movements to like start being like, you know, your insurance br uh, company is your best friend if you're trying to stop a developer. And so yeah. like, uh, you know, you are creating new politics and new assemblages. Those are very scary and they're not always progressive. But they're there are things that like we have to be, I think, open to investigating. So are there ways, for example, people are starting to try to build their own derivative, you know, 
derivati derivative pricing equations mm -hmm. for hedging against, say, energy, uh, carbon-based energy. Um, there's a whole uh, crypto indigenous sovereignty finance movement. I mean, uh, these things may or, you know, my in immediate response is always like, oh, what, neoliberals? Like, oh, that's the final ascent now, everyone. But maybe I need to change my tactic and take really seriously what people are doing in the ground and how, what difference a difference makes about, you know, are people using decentralized finance in Africa? Real, is it the same finance? Is it going to be transformed? So I think there's also a vast amount of diversity and complexity in these systems. And so we have to take that part of Hayek pretty seriously that we don't know the full final result and we need to keep um, diversity and also be intrigued and also investigating what's actually pe what's actually happening um, at a material practical level yeah the constitution of a political subject within these various autonomous systems is is, is a really delicate one and that turn to ways of thinking about temporalities and the non simultaneity of the simultaneous that you get in Ernst Bloch writing yeah. in the 1930s, right here in Berlin, <laughs> about these very issues and the rise of fascism. Trying to think about the different temporalities and how they operate together and how we can be positioned within them, but also maneuver ourselves within them, gives us a little bit of a political subjectivity and allows us to, as you were saying, uh, re-engage certain sorts of tactics that we might have thought were out of bounds or off limits at a certain moment. Yeah. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Yes, this one over here. Better put than me. Okay. <laughs> I was like, why don't you take the question? <laughs> uh, so first of all, thanks indeed. Um, I'm trying to collect my thoughts on what you just presented because it was so dense, but I will try to verbalize this question anyways. I wanted to go back to what you said about the gradual detachment of the world of derivatives from any kind of concept of underlying value, right? Is this slow separation into a world that is purely abstract that doesn't in a way connect the value of derivatives to anything that exists on the ground. So from a historical perspective, I spent 10 years of my life uh, studying economics and especially looking at derivatives because I was living in Greece at the time where everything okay. happened and obviously derivative markets were, were very much involved in mm -hmm. the way the country went down. But then, yeah, at the end point of my involvement with economics, it seemed like there was quite a bit of discourse around the fact that there is a physical limit to which these derivative speculations can go, right? And like you mentioned, at the moment, we're looking at a market that is some 20 times the size of the global GDP. Um, so my question to you is, do you think there is a physical limit to the growth and expansion of these markets and what that limit might look like? Is there an end to that? Because everybody was talking about it as though it's a, or rather, the, the people I was listening to were talking about it as a kind of fiction that would hit a limit, um, but then it hasn't. There so. was always the hope, and then yeah. it wasn't, and then like they start the Belt Road Project, and now we have a new huge yes. well sovereign, you know, so there's always a new frontier, and then there's going to be space, and like there's going to be, you know, and, and people are building super things, but that said, I personally really speak of this as an ideology and an imaginary. Mm -hmm. Like, I do not believe that there is no value. I do believe that sometimes uh, people, you know, th certain things happen, but I'm not sure it's a um, definite, it's more like a, a threshold or a frontier that constantly gets changed than something that's just like, that's it, there's a line in the sand, you can't cross it, that's it. Um, and the reason I say that is because, well, there's is that it's a it's a very it's also a political decision a political like it, you know there's there's actors and agents that decide when they're the, when they want to call the bet in like there were agents in, invested in the subprime mortgage collapse yes. like people <laughs> there were also people really wanting that to happen because you know when it happens they can never no one can ever time these things because it is a complicated system and so yes it's true like what we call a bubble or not is a political decision mm -hmm. so how much like whether my the house in berlin is really worth 700,000 or really the 100,000 when it was 50,000 last year these are not <sighs> the, there's no real value of that house 
I mean, there's a real value in the sense of people need to live places, and then and that I think is the ultimate line. And but that's and as and of course we are working to try to create a value that everyone has a certain standard of living and well-being. That should be the absolute line, really. But it's not. But it's not. But it should be. So I would say for me, yes, there is an absolute value. That house is worth the, you know a certain amount for sure for whoever's living in it and needs that house. But you know the actual thing fluctuations are very arbitrary, and when people decide to call bubbles or not is often mitigated by other geopolitical and other concerns. When we decide to say, "Oh, that house isn't worth seven hundred thousand, or it is," and the market collapses, does that make sense? And then the collapses actually often tend to fuel new innovation, yeah. and and that also people have critique the ideology of the of the cycle the boom bust thing and whether that's like necessary or not but uh it it's part of the fiction but it's a fiction that makes a world so i don't know i i, I, I don't know if that answers anything uh, unfortunately i have to burst the bubble of our wonderful oh, yeah. uh, q a moment here because we are out of time and uh, our schedules are blowing through the, the, de the deadlines. So, but before we do, uh, can I pause and uh, ask us to thank Orit in the traditional manner? <laughs> thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you.